Thank you very much, and it's a great honor. I speak on behalf of Benson, uh, class of 87, Eagle Brook School, to be here. My name is Dachin Carl Thurman, and I'm a yoga teacher in New York City and internationally, and uh, I've just recently produced my first short film. Uh, using many of the artistic skills, many of the leadership skills, many of the great um, experiences and friendships that you know we learned at Eagle Brook School, as, as well as other schools. And <clears throat> my original uh, t uh, title for this talk is Love and Compassion Reboot. And we are going to reboot Love and Compassion. We're going to give you some of the fine print, some of the details, uh, biological and neurological, of Love and Compassion that sometimes aren't shared in the idealistic 1960s interpretation of love and compassion as moral and spiritual absolutes. Love and compassion actually are natural and social trade-offs in which compassion, I focus on the suffering of others and I build allies from the grounds of people that are uh, suffering in a more difficult situation than me. And in the case of love, I'm mirroring joy and finding opportunities and cultivating allies from those who I, I might perceive to be in a higher position to myself. But uh, when I realized I had the chance to come back to Eagle Brook School and reconnect with uh, this environment uh, all kinds of reminiscences and stories came back to me, and I felt I had to share about a, a lost concept called the Biff. Yeah, the Biff, which I heard is no longer part of the Eagle Brook experience. But when we were here, the Biff was how you determined uh, who was who, who was biffing who. What kind of biff did you use? Did you use an ordinary back of the head biff? Did you do a side biff? Was it a biff of love? Was it a from the behind biff? A book biff? Surprise biff? You know, there was, uh, people were known for their creativity in delivering the biff. And I was a small kid uh, I'd skipped a year in school, which made me extra smart, but extra weak on the sports field. And um, my parents were exotic hippies with incredible backgrounds from New York City and Sweden. And I was just a kid from Amherst, Mass. And it all kind of came down to me, all the biffs that I took. Uh, as a Buddhist, I tried to take all the biffs for myself. I thought it was an opportunity to be biffed, that the more I was biffed, the less other people would be biffed, which I learned later is called self-sacrifice <laughs> and is not always uh, reciprocated. <laughs> all right, and they all came, became crystal clear in the uh, winter of 1986 when all those of us from New England got biffed <laughs> by a guy named The Fridge. And most of the Eagle Brook students were international or from some exotic place. And so they kind of jumped on the bandwagon of biffing the New England Patriots fans. So it was a kind of a low point of feeling uh, powerless and yet um, inviting more and more biffs. Um, which led me to the question, you know, what is love? What is love? Is it just being nice to everybody? Is it just being passive and letting people biff you? Uh, but there's some reason there's, people love you know, uh, those who are powerful, right? And so the more I got biffed by the bullies, the more I loved them and wanted them to have what they wanted. And so it really came down to a question of love, though, that I've learned recently, that love is not purely the intention to do good, okay? Love is the intention and capacity. Loving kindness, according to Thich Nhat Hanh, the Nobel Prize winning Buddhist monk who provided aid and comfort to all sides in the conflict of Vietnam, uh, loving kindness is not only the desire to make someone happy, to bring joy to a beloved person, it is the ability to bring joy and happiness to the person you love. Because even if your intention is 
to make that person happy, your love might make him or her suffer. This is one of the paradoxes of love. Uh, when we focus on love, we ignore the causes of suffering. The human mind is a bit limited, and the human senses can only focus on a few things at once. So to focus on opportunities and joy means to take your focus away from suffering and the causes of suffering. And this does lead to uh, a relationship to our submissive states. Now to get here to Eagle Brook every day from Amherst, Massachusetts as a day student, I had to ride the public bus. And the public bus was a group of Amherst kids from the Eagle Brook School, sitting in the front of the bus, and the kids from the Bement School sitting in the back of the bus. And as I grew and hit my teenage years, age 13, and I decided I wanted to assert myself and, and be a winner and no longer be a loser, I decided that where I would start was where I ha could have the most impact. And this was, on this 20-minute bus ride, changing the social dynamic. Because up till that point, the bus was ruled by the Amherst Bementors, who would sit in the back of the bus, because they had to get off the bus uh, after we did. So it was really more a logistical reason. <laughs> but my good friend, Aaron Jolly, who was a powerful athlete, and he was a great role model and upon whom I imprinted. You know, him and I came up with a scheme, and one Monday morning, Aaron Jolly and myself and the other Amherst Eagle Brookers, we seized the back of the bus. We took over the back of the bus because that's where the cool kids sit. They don't sit in the front of the bus next to the bus driver. They sit in the back. And they welcome you and tell you everyone else where to sit from their vantage point as far from the authority figure as possible. And so, yes, the 1987 bus turf war was a lesser known conflict in Eagle Brook history. It was an in-group in conflict with day students only. Just like the boarding students had all these fun games in the dorms, the day students had their fun and games on the bus. Yes, and the outer world echoed this. This reminded me of love and social mobility. Fantastic author Loretta Graziano Bruning writes in her I Mammal, Why Your Brain Links Status and Happiness. Truth be told, love is linked to status. No one likes to admit it, and no one intends to love in this way. But people typically fall in love with someone who raises their status. And uh, this just uh, carried me you know, through these other questions about um, love. And ultimately, in 1987, I decided to change where I was from. I was no longer a small town Amherst kid, but I was a New York kid. And like my uncle taught me, I began to root for the New York Giants and was quickly rewarded with being a winner. <laughs> right, external validation. Of course, we, we philosophically say we should not seek it, and yet it's there. It's external validation. Um, it brings me to what is compassion? Right? Is, it, is it just feeling sorry for people? Is it having empathy? Is it dominating the world? You know, what is it? How do, we, how do we cultivate compassion? And where does it come from? Is it a habit? Is it an instinct? Love and compassion, biologically speaking, come from the mirror neurons. Monkey see, monkey do, monkey feel, monkey cry, monkey see, monkey get mad. You know, so we learn not only physical activities like tying our shoe or eating our food or how we stand, how we dress, but we learn emotional reactions from one another. And suffering is the basis of our bonding with other people on the level of compassion. So this was the Buddha's first truth, that all suffering has value. It leads to the ability to have compassion. Everyone who had compassion for you in your life, they had compassion for you, because they had suffered something very similar to you at your age, and they remembered. And they remember immediately when they empathically experience it in you. 
Now, the fine print of compassion, though, is like love, it's not only an intention and an empathy. It's an ability to do something. It's a power. It's a strength. And the more compassionate you are, the more power and the more strength you want. Until eventually, your need for power and strength might not be recognized by others as having a compassionate motivation. People might think you're just on a power trip. And yet compassion really is the basis for us to see our suffering in others, uh, to cross political boundaries, uh, to cross boundaries of species, boundaries of gender, boundaries of um, uh, sexual orientation or uh, wealth or poor divide. And they come from simple actions of simple kindness, right? to share food, to share comfort, and just to share in the experience of suffering, and in so doing, create a stronger hierarchy, a stronger unity against that suffering. You know, the, the journey from being a, a dish rag, from being a, a, a wimp, to being a leader, did have to go through a, a messy phase, where I kind of overdid it. I was trying to assert myself. I was trying to defend myself. And in so doing, I became a little bit. I mirrored the actions of the bullies who bullied me in the first two years of uh, the bus trips to the school. And uh, I was trying so hard to build up my power so I could be compassionate and protect the other nerds that I began to persecute. Uh, and this did draw the attention of the faculty and parents and other students, you know. But it led me to an amazing sixth form year where with the right guidance, with some intervention, some dialogue between the teachers and my parents and myself, uh, I resolved to be a leader of an Eagle Brook school that had no bullying at all, where we were having such a great time connecting with each other that we didn't need to, to, to bully each other in order to raise our status. And uh, I reconciled with many of the former bullies, and I did my best to apologize to those whom I had bullied myself and left behind a legacy of compassion and love at Eagle Brook School, which to this day carries on as I hear from Headmaster Chase. You guys don't even know what the word biff means. <laughs> it's only the old schoolers know biff. Uh, so lastly, how can compassion and love prevent bullying and hazing and lead us to a world of friendship between enemies? Engage leadership training. Right? Recognizing those who have that assertiveness and that dominant quality, that there is latent compassion waiting for them to express. Uh, encouraging self-defense, you know, recognizing that, that uh, some people are submissive and they send signals that it's okay to push them around. They actually almost want to be um, bullied as a form of establishing a bond and finding a dominant ally. Right? Something that they invite. So self-defense, very good. Or you know, general athletics like you have here. Promoting peacemaking and reconciliation and finding methods like this, creating dialogues and opening Eagle Brook experience up to the world, all aspects of it. And harnessing the source of inner strength, which comes from empathy. And that leads us to the better biff. Right? A biff between friends or a a high five. And thank you very much.